Hey guys, have you been thinking about using the ketogenic diet to help support your Hashimoto's weight loss? But because of all the different opinions online, it's hard to know exactly how many carbohydrates you should be eating? Well, here's one more opinion coming at you, but hopefully today we'll take a little bit more of a nuanced approach. That way you can identify how many carbs are good for your body and what will support your health and weight loss goals. So stick with me today if that sounds like a good plan, and we'll talk about how to get your body into nutritional ketosis, why that is a good goal or desired outcome, and different strategies that you can use to know how many carbohydrates you should be consuming. And if this is the kind of content that you like and enjoy, make sure that you subscribe and ring the bell. That way you'll know when I post videos every single week. My name is Dr. Brad Bodel, and I help women with Hashimoto's and low thyroid lose weight and improve their energy naturally. And one of the strategies that we use in the clinic is the ketogenic diet. But before we get into talking about the specifics of carbohydrate consumption, let's just talk about how we get into nutritional ketosis in general. So a lot of people have preconceived notions about what the keto diet is all about. Whether they think it's high fat, high protein, low protein, low carb, all bacon, all cheese, you know, whatever it might be, here's the deal. At the end of the day, a keto diet is an approach to eating or not eating that results in a decrease in the available amount of glucose. And if your body's demand for glucose exceeds the amount that is available to it, it will start to look for other avenues to getting energy. And one of the ways that it does that is by breaking down our fat cells, which it can then turn into things like fatty acids and ketone bodies, which we can measure on different types of blood tests. However, with that all said, there are different ways or more optimal ways of achieving this outcome. Now, the most common ways to decrease the amount of available glucose and put us into nutritional ketosis include fasting, decreasing the amount of carbohydrates that we're consuming dietarily, increasing the amount of exercise or activity that we're participating in, and we can even just reduce our overall caloric intake. In fact, and this may go a little bit counter to what you may have been reading or hearing, but we can have a completely 100% carbohydrate-based diet and still be in nutritional ketosis. The thing is, we have to be at starvation levels where the amount of carbohydrates that we're taking in is so low that, again, the amount of glucose available to our body, the demand that our body has, isn't met by that. And therefore, again, our body starts to look for other resources to fill that void. That being said, just because we can induce nutritional ketosis through certain strategies doesn't mean that we should. And doing something like a starvation diet, while it may be effective in the short term, long term it can have negative implications for your metabolism and actually make it harder for you to lose weight and maintain that weight loss. Therefore, our goal is to have a well-formulated keto diet, one that mimics the weight loss of low calorie and fasting, but doesn't come with the long-term detrimental side effects. And the way that we achieve that is through carbohydrate restriction and managing the amount of activity that we're doing. Once we do that, we can then consume calories in a way that allows us to feel full and satiated, supports our energy and our sleep, and allows all those other health parameters that we track to improve as well. So now that we know how nutritional ketosis can be achieved, the question becomes, why is this a good thing to do? and it comes back to the hormone insulin. Now, if we're dealing with Hashimoto's, one of the hallmarks of Hashimoto's and autoimmunity in general is the increased levels of inflammation. And inflammation can wreak havoc with a lot of the hormonal receptors in our body, one of those being the insulin receptors. Now, if you recall, insulin is the hormone that we use to shuttle glucose from the bloodstream into our cells so it can be burned for energy. But if we have that increased level of inflammation, that process doesn't work as well. So if you compare someone with Hashimoto's to someone who doesn't have Hashimoto's and ask them to both eat about 50 grams of carbohydrates, what you'll see in general is the person with Hashimoto's will have higher glucose levels in their bloodstream for longer. What this requires our body to do is increase the amount of insulin released and keep that in the bloodstream as well for a longer duration of time to ideally manage the leftover glucose. When this happens, when we have higher insulin in the blood for long periods of time, 
it puts our body into a state of storage. Whenever insulin is up, we are not going to be burning or breaking down fat, we are going to be storing fat. Therefore, this is one of the main issues that causes people to have problems with weight loss when they have Hashimoto's. It's not just about the amount of thyroid hormone, it's about how it relates to all these other hormones which regulate and manage our metabolism. So the reason why we wanna have the goal of getting into ketosis is one, the dramatic drop in carbohydrate intake actually reduces the amount of pressure on the body on a particular system that isn't working well. And two, if we can actually achieve that drop in carbohydrates, which leads to a decrease in insulin levels, which in this situation would be favorable for us, we can then track and confirm that that's happening because the lower insulin levels will allow the breakdown of fat, which will allow the increase in blood ketones on our monitor. So if we know that carbohydrate restriction can get us into ketosis and that that would be a favorable outcome for people who have Hashimoto's and are looking to lose weight, then a the question comes back to how much should we be eating? And this is the thing that people love to argue about online. And for me, whenever I see a lot of disagreement in a particular space, it always tells me that there is no one size fits all answer. And so what we always have to ask ourselves is wherever we're at, is that choice allowing us to have the outcomes that we desire? So whatever our carbohydrate consumption is right now, is that leading to the goals that we want to achieve? And if it isn't, then maybe we need to make some modifications. Now you guys know that I love to tell you to listen to your body and see what makes you feel the best. But sometimes when different practitioners do that, it doesn't give people any guidelines for where they should start from. So, in general, for people starting a ketogenic diet, I recommend that they reduce their carbohydrate intake to under 30 net grams of carbohydrates per day. And just as a reminder, a net carbohydrate is when we take the total amount of carbohydrates in a food and we subtract the amount of fiber because that isn't absorbed into our bloodstream and doesn't have an effect on our blood glucose. So for example, if a food has 30 grams of carbohydrates in it and it has 10 grams of fiber, then the net carbs is 20 net carbs, and that's the number that you would use to count against your daily allotment. However, remember how I said earlier in this video that there's different ways that we can increase that demand for glucose that far outstrips the amount that's freely available for us? Well, this is where that comes back into play. So if you're someone who leads a very active lifestyle or you have a job that is very physically demanding, your need for glucose is going to be much higher than someone who has a much more sedentary lifestyle. But here's the tricky part, and this is something that's super specific to people with thyroid issues who are trying to do the ketogenic diet. And that is that you don't necessarily have to have an active lifestyle to have a higher demand for glucose. In fact, the inflammation and stress that comes with these thyroid changes can actually cause you to burn glucose much more quickly. So just for an example, let's think about times when maybe there's a little bit more emotional stress in your life or your time at work is being really hard on you. In those scenarios, people tend to crave something sweet. They tend to crave something carby. And the reason for that is because they're burning through their glucose stores much more quickly than they normally would. And your brain is trying to compensate for that by having you get some of those foods that will quickly replace those stores. So the point is this, just because you're not an athlete doesn't mean that you don't have a higher demand for some freely available glucose. And because of that, you may be required to increase your carbohydrate consumption, and that doesn't mean that it is going to kick you out of ketosis. So if you have a day where you are more active, working out more, or feeling a little bit more stressed, you may be able to consume 50, 100, 150, even 200 grams of carbohydrates depending on the demand, and you'll still be able to stay in ketosis because all of those carbs are being used up readily and immediately to help replace the ones that have already been consumed. Now, of course, this is not a free pass to eat cake all the time, and there's no way that you can out-exercise poor nutritional choices on a regular basis. But honestly, if we do increase our carbohydrate intake and it does kick us out of ketosis, 
we have to ask ourselves, what is most important? Now, obviously, I think that nutritional ketosis can confer some powerful health benefits, but it really is just a number on a blood meter. And if we are still achieving our goals, we're feeling well, we're performing well, and from time to time coming out of ketosis doesn't cause any interruption in that, then don't sweat it. Some people will need to be more strict, others won't. You just have to be able to find out what is optimal for you and your body. Now, starting with a baseline number and playing around with those amounts as you change your activity levels isn't concise enough for you. The thing that I really heartily recommend is getting a blood keto monitor and potentially a continuous glucose monitor. With the blood keto monitor, it will allow you to see if your choices are allowing you to get above the 0.5 millimolars per liter that will indicate that you are breaking down fat. If you don't see that number above 0.5, then your choices are not being successful for you. And you can yell at the meter all you want, but the proof is in the pudding, and that is the benefit or the advantage of following a ketogenic diet. And while a blood keto monitor can be great to check your ketone levels in the morning and in the evening to track how you're doing, a continuous glucose monitor is great because it gives you a little bit more real-time feedback. So even though there isn't a one-to-one -one correlation between glucose levels and ketone levels, if you are tracking your progress and you see that certain foods are spiking your blood sugar above 130 micrograms per deciliter, then there is a higher likelihood that the increased glucose is leading to increased insulin and that will cause a decrease in fat breakdown and therefore a decrease in ketone levels. So this type of information may inform you to see that, hey, these kinds of foods are preventing the production of ketones, which means that anytime I consume them, it is going to diminish the amount of fat loss and fat breakdown that's occurring. So to summarize the information that we covered today, nutritional ketosis can be achieved when our body's demand for glucose outpaces the amount of freely available glucose. And that can be done through fasting, carbohydrate restriction, increased exercise, or low calorie diets. Now the reason that we want to get into nutritional ketosis is because when we have Hashimoto's and thyroid issues, the increased levels of inflammation makes us less sensitive to insulin, and that causes insulin to stay in the bloodstream longer. When that happens, it makes us more likely to store fat rather than break down fat, and therefore it can interrupt our ability to lose weight. Now, a good place for most people to start when we talk about carbohydrate restriction is looking at consuming less than 30 net grams of carbohydrates per day. But you may need to consume less if you are less sensitive to insulin, or you may need to include more carbohydrates if you have increased stress levels in your life or increased activity levels. And even 50, 100, 150, or more grams of carbohydrates per day may be necessary depending on your demand. But the best way to be able to track that besides just paying attention to your symptoms and how you feel is by getting a blood keto monitor and a continuous glucose monitor. If you can look at those different types of devices and you can see on the blood keto monitor that your ketones are above 0.5 millimolars per deciliter and that your glucose is typically staying less than 130 milligrams per deciliter, then those are great indicators that you are on track and you should be seeing those changes in the way that you think, feel, and perform. If you want more information on the keto diet and how it can help your Hashimoto's and help you to achieve your health goals, make sure you check out my video on Hashimoto's and keto done right, and I'll link that in the card above, that way you have easy access to it. You can also always send me an email at contact at seattlethyroidhelp.com and inquire about working with me one-on-one, -on -one, and I'll make sure to get you all the information you need to be able to set up a free consultation to see if we're a good fit to work together. You can also grab my free download, which is 109 foods to boost your thyroid and improve your energy. It's a list of foods that you should and shouldn't eat when you're dealing with thyroid problems, and you can grab that at the link in the description box below. Thanks so much for watching and hanging with me all the way to the end, you guys. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments box below. And also, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. 
I hope you guys have an absolutely wonderful day. My name is Dr. Brad Bodel, and I will see you guys next time.